Guangzhou, South China's economic, cultural and political center, is striving to become an international transportation hub. The city is playing a key role in the construction of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. As a highly vibrant region, the Bay Area accounts for less than 5% of China's population, but contributes 12% of the national GDP. Now it is on a fast track to become a world-class city cluster, leading the country's opening up and innovation in decades to come. With a better business environment, a higher level of market integration, and alignment with international market standards, the Greater Bay Area will become the pillar supporting the Belt and Road Initiative on the global stage. An acute concern in Europe over the BRI is China spreading its geopolitical influence under the framework. Italy became the first G7 nation to formally endorse the BRI, while more European countries are still making up their minds. Key states, like Germany and France, say China must improve access and fair competition for foreign firms. Can China's efforts overcome Europe's doubts? At the end of the day, can bilateral cooperation in economy and trade generate more trust between China and the EU in politics and security? This June, CGTN's Dialogue and German network NDR meet again to explore the potential of China-Europe interaction. Tune in for Dialogue with the World, this time in Guangzhou. The past few months have seen roller coaster changes in Europe-China relations. High-level exchanges are more often, and we've seen greater cohesion at the EU level to forge closer links with China. But there is still divergence on issues such as uh, participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. How do both sides look at their strategic relationship? And where does EU stand in light of US-China trade disputes? To answer these questions and more, welcome to Dialogue with the World coming to you from Guangzhou. Ray, thank you so much. It feels good to be here on stage with you. Uh, again, and let me check, you even stand the scorching heat and humidity of southern China. No chocolate coating over here. We're in the same boat, but not necessarily on the same page. It's, it's a good symbol, and I hope we won't drown together, but we will sail into the future. Guangzhou is another Chinese mega city with more than 10 million inhabitants. It is part of this vibrant Pearl River Delta where projects are started that are going to shape our future. Just some weeks ago, I guess, they even delivered parcels by drones here in Guangzhou. By the way, that was achieved by one of the many Chinese-German um, joint ventures, DHL, I guess, uh, was that. Um, so let's look at the future, not look back at what happened 30 years ago when this was still a fisherman's village. Our program is called Dialogue, and we want to share an open discussion. And I say hi to two German experts I brought with me. From Germany, one is Sabine Stricker-Keller, a leading lawyer on Chinese-German uh, affairs, now living in Munich, very experienced in dealing with uh, German companies in China. She also advises the German Minister of Economy. And Wolfgang Niedermark, chief representative of German industry and commerce based in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be joined here by Mr. Andrzej Sertowicz. He's a moderator and director of uh, Germany's NDR. Join me now on this side. Our Chinese guest speaker is uh, Charles Liu, founder of How Capital, and Professor Liu Xiaolei from Guanghua School of Management, Peking University. Welcome, all of you, to our dialogue with the world. To begin with, Welcome to the Pearl River Delta region, and the pearl might be the pearl of the crown in China's <laughs> economic development. <laughs> it started shining already. Let me ask you, Wolfgang, um, how would you rate the success of the Greater Bay Area given that the Guangdong province, and Macau and Hong Kong, their political different system, cultural backgrounds are different. How would you rate the success? Yeah, um, we are really bullish on this Greater Bay Area plan. Um, it's not actually it's not a new concept at all. We have been profiting from the Pearl River Delta development uh, over the recent decades, and hundreds of German companies are manufacturing here. But the new thing is now that we are focusing on high tech. Uh, now it's really getting a high tech window to the world. Uh, many companies would like to be part of it. Um, we, as a German chamber system, we have three offices in this region, in Guangdong, in Shenzhen, and in Hong Kong. And we cooperate and we integrate. And what we're now hoping for is that this integration um, is 
making business easier. So the ease of business should be uh, profiting from the whole development plan so that we have cross-border banking, uh, easier access to the uh, employment markets, vice versa. Um, and of course it only works, and Andreas has um, said that, it only works better than other regions because we have this charming combination of one country, two systems. And of course the precondition is that we protect this system, yeah, this principle of two systems, so that we have in Hong Kong and Macau special administrative zones with their own currency, rule of law, the other pillars, free flow of capital, free flow of people, and to freedom of speech. And this has to be uh, continued. And then uh, we are really optimistic that uh, we can uh, together profit from these. I'm planning. pleased that our German friends are still talking smart about the hallmarks of globalization, such as free flow of thoughts, services, products, human resources, everything that the Brexit goes against uh, at this moment. Charles, what do you think of the implications uh, of further economic integration between the three parts, Hong Kong, Guangdong, that represent nine cities in this province, the coastal province, and Macau, by the way. Do you think that we're going to have a broad impact as a result? I, I think, uh, first of all, I totally agree with what Wolfgang said. It is uh, a very interesting combination. It is also the most vibrant part of Asia. It's not just a vibrant part of China in terms of economic development. But what's most interesting for me with my investments on the ground is the supply chain, and especially in high-tech area, where, for example, for a prototype to be made in Germany of some product, ordering components will take six to eight weeks. But in Shenzhen or the neighboring area, within 10 kilometers, you can have all the components already there. Yeah. So this supply chain enhances efficiency, which is what business seek, and that is what this whole greater Bay Area, I think, represents for the future of technology development. There are some countries, of course, which are going against efficiency, promoting inefficiency. Uh, I hope that doesn't succeed because the greater Bay Area's efficiency in the supply chain is going to benefit the world. You were probably talking about trade with the United States and the global trade war. We'll come back to that later. but. Uh, I'll pick you up on the United States. Silicon Valley is sort of the example that creates a lot of business. Um, the GDP is still much higher also in the Tokyo area than at the Greater Barrier area. Sabini, what must happen um, for this area, the Greater Barrier, to be able to compete? What should be achieved? I, I think what we, the business community and also the foreign com business community always has to remember that we talk about integration, but at the same time, on the commercial terms, on the legal terms, Hong Kong is foreign. So when it comes to the legal investment environment for the Hong Kong companies going into the Chinese side, the Guangzhou Greater Bay Area, the investments are qualified as foreign. So the Hong Kong investors or the German companies or European companies going through Hong Kong still have to comply with the same laws as if they came from Germany directly to Guangzhou. So give me give you two examples. If we have foreign investment restrictions in China, the same applies for those companies coming from Hong Kong. They have to watch out whether they can really integrate or the, whether there are market access restriction over here. The other way, for example, is the cybersecurity and the data. You talk about, you know, it's, it's the startups, it's the new economies, uh, the modern economies here. It all depends on data. So how China implements the data, uh, the cybersecurity and the data protection also affects directly the business in the Greater Bay Area because the total data integration with Hong Kong means an integration between domestic and foreign countries and companies. So when we are on a positive note, we just hope that the development of this area is a driver in, in opening it up and in allowing greater integration between domestic and foreign entities and data and, and business uh, dealings. So, so that's the challenge that we shouldn't Some forget. They are ahead, yeah. You are yeah. perfectly all right, but um, the advantage Hong Kong is offering is that you find all the professional services in Hong Kong, the lawyers, the uh, investment Accounts. bankers, you find them all and they help you to proceed. And therefore back in 1997 with the handover of Hong Kong, we did expect to enjoy enormously the benefits of their legal knowledge, their 
rule of law, their protection of private ownership, and so on and so forth. I wonder if uh, Professor Liu Xiaowei could brief us quickly with your first-hand account on the advantages of uh, other Bay Area, such as uh, San Francisco, Tokyo Bay. Can we draw a parallel comparison between our greater Bay Area integration with the similar ones in the West and in our immediate neighbor of Japan? Yeah, Ray, I actually uh, have some statistics in this regard. Um, first, about the um, population, and the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Bay Area has a population about 67 million, compared to Tokyo, 43, and the New York, Bay Area, 23 million, and San Francisco, 7 million. So population-wise here is definitely the largest. And in terms of land area, 56 square kilometers here in the greater Bay Area in China, and which is way larger than the other three, is almost double. Uh, the New York and San Francisco. In the GDP wise, also the greater Bay Area is uh, 1.38 trillion US dollar. Uh, it's comparable to the other three. So in terms of both population, land area, and the GDP, I think this greater Bay Area is comparable to the other three. However, if we measure from, for example, GDP per capita, it's still way less. Here is about uh, 20,000 and the largest, the, the, the highest one is San Francisco, 114,000 uh, GDP per capita. And also, in my understanding, the technology and the innovation drive here is still need to be catched up. However, in my opinion, we do enjoy one very special advantage here, because the other three big area has kind of one focus of one dimension. For example, New York is focused on finance, and San Francisco is on high-tech innovation, and uh, Tokyo is on smart manufacturing. And here in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, Hong Kong is kind of international finance center, obviously, and Shenzhen has been enjoying this high-tech and innovation for the past kind of decades. And uh, Guangdong has been a traditional manufacturing area and the supply chain, like Charles said, and moving to the smart manufacturing. So we kind of enjoy all these dimensions and can have this complement of advantage. So really has the p potential to become a really strong um, kind of, the I, I, I want to see number one, a good one. <laughs> A uh, skeptical look of our <laughs> European friends here on this side show clearly that they are not sure about the relationship between government and the market. Whether always, the, always a topic in China. <laughs> whether the idea of a market uh, economy be mm. uh, compromised as a result, as a result of the uh, economic integration. I'd like to have uh, your thoughts, of Sabina, about whether the powerful government in the mainland uh, will be more of a block than a driving force behind this idea of a uh, Great Bay integration. Mm -hmm. yeah, gov government and market, it's government and law, and um, we, we don't know the answer because it's a question of where does innovation come from. Mm -hmm. That's about the same topic, you know, will the innovation come from uh, private enterprises having a free flow area where they can um, have their ideas, or do we have a top-down government um, idea about where the innovation come from? So. So I think that's the one problem where we don't see the future. We always believed in the innovation will come from bottom up and will come from the companies going up and there should be as least interference as possible, but we don't have the answer whether really that will be uh, the, the driver in the future. You know, uh, there is a popular assumption in the mainland of China that uh, we have the five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine stands for a uh, number of innovative enterprises in the private economy and uh, eight means 80% of the uh, job employment, um, the seven, perhaps uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call the revenue and the 50, whatever tax mm -hmm. collection. So the uh, non-public sector does contribute enormously uh, to the GDP uh, totality. Charles, I wonder if you can add a few more points about the importance of uh, non-public sector, the SMEs, uh, in terms of their innovation, because we're talking about innovation as the driving force behind the greater integration. In my work as an investor, I only invest in private sector companies, of course. It's very difficult to invest mm -hmm. in state-owned companies. Well, it's not in my position to. But I think there are two sides to this. What the role of the government is, it's worldwide, everywhere, is to provide infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In certain stage of development, if you provide an infrastructure, you will facilitate the SMEs 
to be able to be ingenious in developing new products, new services. And for the past 30 years, 40 years, the first 20 years, is the government's allocation of funds and dedication to building of infrastructure to be able to build the supply chain, to be able to be more efficient in manufacturing. So I think there's always a balance to what the government should and must do. But would, and would you still say it's today still the case that the big state-owned companies are there for infrastructure and the private companies are there for innovation? Or are the differences just rather murky? Well, I think, you know, based on what the U.S. government says, is interesting. Well, no, based on what you said. <laughs> I would like to add that um, it's a very important factor that we finally, for this Greater Bay Area project, we have the blessing, in a way, from Beijing. So they really, uh, with this Greater Bay Outline Plan, um, have explained their vision and explicitly focusing on the appreciation, sector, exactly. yeah, appreciation of this private sector role, the role of Hong Kong with the one country two system, and now we hope that this will be also delivered. If it's just a part of a mainlandization process of Hong Kong, then it wouldn't work. It's, it's I can give you, I can give you a very simple example of what the central government is doing. It is just, it's just one small example. Um, small and medium-sized companies have difficulties getting financing from banks. We all know that. It's the big SOEs and the big companies who get it. So the central bank, PBOC, has launched a project for the Greater Bay Area based in Shenzhen, taking the credit facility of the big companies, in this particular trial case is BYD, the auto manufacturer, and then using their credit facility through blockchain to provide financing to the thousands of suppliers, second tier and third tier suppliers of components to BYD. So there are attempts to improve that system. Let me go from the area here to the broader picture of investment in China and the business relations um, to my German experts. How would you assess the Chinese business environment at the moment, there have been plans to improve uh, protection of rights, etc., transparency, etc. But in a recent poll we had with the European Chamber of Commerce in Beijing, 600 European companies said 20% were still forced to have a technological transfer and 60% of them in the last two years. So is this going to change and improve? Sabine, what's your guess? Yeah. Um my guess is that we have and had continuously over the last years a continuous improvement of the investment environment in the sense of improving the investment laws and the market access conditions. So let me point to two things. The one is the foreign investment law uh, China came up with recently, um, which was at the end much, much shorter than the draft. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more a policy paper. I think in modern days where we are today, a policy paper could be more important than a law if you really need 100% policy backing. But of course, for the business people, a policy paper lacks ingredients. So we need the implementation for that to see um, what is really coming. But on the technology, forced technology transfer, as we call it, and I think this is what the American claimed for, for months and months to come, it's a term that is really very vague. And I, for the statistics, very tough to say. In the old days, we called it, and the Americans still call it, forced technology transfer when a foreign company was forced to enter into a joint venture in order to get market access. So it was a totally voluntary decision whether it wants to go to China. It was not forced to go to China. It was only the method how it can gain access that was mandatory, but it wasn't forced in a way. So the more China reduces the list of items that require a joint venture, the more this aspect is mm -hmm. gone. So then we have but the other part is really stealing technology. You know, how, much, how far does the intellectual uh, property protection go? That's a totally different version. Or whether the Chinese government in terms of licensing requires more disclosure than others. So the, the statistics is really tough because it's the company says, I feel that my technology is not 100% protected. But in what sense, whether it's just by, by disclosing too much or by not having any market access, that's tough. I think the much tougher part is, are we doing enough against theft of technology, where copycats, where companies copy my machine and copy my know-how, and far less, I think, 
that the government is forcing a transfer of technology. That's putting the new foreign investment law based on American pressure, I believe, but it's more a policy statement that China you know, defends itself. Yes, indeed, that was, uh, it sounds uh, like a Lex Trump, Trump veto. Yes, I, yeah. called it, I called it a Lex Trump some time ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we would definitely prefer if there is no uh, private uh, foreign investment law at all. The best situation would be if all companies, being a Chinese or international German American companies, are all treated on the same, on the same way. We really have a level playing field. That would be um, the best situation. Of course, I would admit that in certain areas which are relevant for security issues and, and the public interest, yes, uh, you have perhaps some restrictions. But in general, if we would have the same situation here in uh, China as we have it in Europe, that actually every company is treated the same way, that would be perfect. Actually, we do not really need a foreign just, Are we talking about the utopian notions since President Trump goes against this idea of free trade and globalization, unilateral policy moves by Washington threaten to derail what we have felt so comfortable with so far, the process of globalization. So, Shaoli, I wonder if uh, uh, with the idea of a uh, level playing field, uh, are you confident that uh, the foreign investment law that was adopted by the National People's Congress, our top, top legislature, will encourage local authorities in China to abide by laws, not to abuse uh, regulations and uh, articles in this foreign investment law for their own local favors? Actually, I agree with what Wolfgang just said. It's not just protection of foreign IP. Actually, in China, it's a general IP protection should be enforced. And I believe the government is moving toward that direction. I'll we'll give you some, some numbers. Yeah, yeah the, the world IP indicator shows China is actually the number one IP applicant in terms of number of IP applications in 2017, 1.38 million. And number two in terms of global IP applicant. So we are actually doing more innovation locally. And so we are at a stage need lots of IP protection, not only to the foreign investor, but to local, like non-SOEs enterprise as well. Can I have a quick uh, response from Charles about uh, the idea of a trade-off uh, with uh, uh, your advanced technology, you're going to have a greater market shares in China. And Europeans and Americans have all expressed their strong skeptical view about whether this is legitimate. Uh, President Trump complained bitterly about this. Well, first of all, Madame, what you said was brilliant. I mean, that's exactly what the legal circumstances are. I've been doing business in China for 40 years. I've never seen a case in which the Chinese government puts a gun to your head and says yeah. you have to transfer technology. It's always company to company who come to these agreements. Mm. You want access to the market, you form a joint venture. You form a joint venture, you have to transfer technology. You transfer technology, you collect the transfer of technology fee, mm -hmm. in fact. And if you talk about copying, I can go back to the 1980s. I remember right here in the Pearl River Delta with American and Italian importers taking products to Chinese manufacturers and say, copy this exactly, but make it cheaper than Taiwan. <laughs> and we will give you the technology to copy it perfectly. You know, so I think in terms of technology side, first of all, access to market, access to market, sure, it's a decision that a company makes. Do you want this access to market? I've never seen in 40 years a single case in which it's a gun to put to the head. Yeah, but there Let are me, design I, institutes and we, no, we sure. have what collected <coughs> some cases where, where we could observe a kind of forced technology transfer. I, I want to come back to both of your questions because we got stuck in, in what I would call February <laughs> and we didn't, didn't, I didn't go further when we said that we are optimistic and we still believe in, in the reforms coming, but we have serious trends where our system, what we require, really is affected in China. And let me say, what a business person needs is rule of law, trust, and predictability. And we have a few items where the predictability, sorry, where the predictability really goes, you know, a very difficult road. And one is in the foreign investment law. The foreign investment law has a clause. If a foreign country imposes certain restriction on Chinese companies, China can retaliate and do the same. So this is a reciprocity clause or retaliatory clause, whatever you call it, which I have never seen in any other law in my life 
So that is something where the business person really worries, is my investment still predictable if something else happens somewhere in the world which I cannot influence? Is and this, I think the same is, happens is this, now. Is this clause a precaution against trade with the United States? I, or I is, it, so. is it made because of the experience recently that, German, that Chinese companies have made in Germany well, and in Europe where they couldn't invest in certain We don't know. I think when the law came out, it was the ha one of the serious phases of the trade war. But when the law was drafted, mm -hmm. that was already last year and earlier, it wasn't that tight yet, so I don't know why it came in. But if you had to look at the very recent developments in China of last week, when China decided, as a retaliatory act, to establish a list of unreliable entities, whoever does not do business with China for non-commercial reasons can be blacklisted. So for us as business people, and I guess Charles says the same, and lawyers, it's really the worst you can do in terms of unpredictable if you have lists, if you have blacklists and reciprocity. But that's actually and totally irrelevant if you compare that to <coughs> what we're getting from the United States. It's, I, I think, you know, if we In terms of unpredictability. I mean, that's right. Yeah. It's, unless you do something to protect yourself and defend yourself, what we're getting from the Trump administration, from the ideologue is, we don't care if it hurts you. We don't care if it hurts ourselves. And in fact, it's going to hurt the whole world. But we don't care. We will do it anyway. Here is my personal concerns. I've done so many interviews. I've got the rough impression. So many economists and their government show unprecedented concerns on national security, which is being abused by, first of all, the Trump administration, and increasingly, perhaps, in Germany, when some of my, where some of my friends uh, say, complain bitterly that uh, merchant and acquisition in your country, Germany, prove a lot more difficult than before, and national security is often cited as an excuse. So wh what do you think of... Uh, mm. well, just choose your friends, I'm carefully, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they experience problems. But we have this discussion in Germany with Huawei, for example, and the question, should Huawei be allowed uh, to establish a 5G network? Whole discussion over Europe. Um, it's not finished yet, and in Germany, I, I wonder what's going to happen, um, and I wonder what China is going to do if Germany refused Huawei to sort of be in business here. What do you think? Can we can we first answer Ray's question about the experience of Chinese investment <laughs> in, uh, in in Europe and Germany in particular? Yes, we have had some cases where there were some uh, special. Uh, approvals necessary and it was with regard to power grids uh, where Chinese companies can easily invest in Portuguese power grid companies and uh, we, we said well is it okay we cannot dream about it uh, to invest in such uh, ventures here in China so vice versa mm -hmm. we have to take a closer look well, that was a, a single case Chancellor but Angela Merkel says yeah. clearly that Germany does have its own security standards Germany's Germans don't have to be lectured by Americans about uh, how to protect their own uh, telecommunication uh, network. And she's so perfectly it, right. Trump has some points in his criticism, but the methods and the way he performs well, it, we won't agree. Yes, we yes, that's, not that's just right. a negotiation. And just add to the point about this, uh, how safe the market is. I have this recent survey done by a German commercial bank, Common Z Bank. And I'm from university, so I like to talk about numbers. It's, it's published in May this year. It's surveyed 2,000 Germany firms, and I read from this report. Companies in the SME sector currently assess China as being a more reliable trading partner than the USA or Great British, 30% versus 17% and 8%. So that's the report done yeah. by Germany, yeah. a well-known uh, survey company. Yeah, yeah but, but you, have to, you have to be uh, <laughs> clear on that. This is an SME survey, and it yeah. is spoiled by the rhetorics, by the way of acting these, all these but irritating it, it decisions. So the public image is that the United States and presidency is disrupting whilst China is advocating the case for multilateralism and free trade depending on their um, well on, on, on their strategies but still advocating the multilateral um, 
uh, institutions and the free oh. trade as well. And, so and I still believe, and I still believe example, it's right for SMEs because the SMEs, when they come to China and when their project is below the political radar, when it's not politically sensitive what they are doing, they have a very free market. They don't need to go to a joint venture. They can do it by themselves and they have done it over 30 years. So for them, China has been or is quite predictable. And now comes mm. the new administration in the United States and for an SME, this is just a world it or she isn't familiar with, you know. It's an unfamiliar territory. So that's why the survey rightly says at the end, you know, well, we think China is predictable. Uh, well, uh, well, whether that's going to change, change, we don't know. Whether that's going to change, we don't know. Let change. me ask you one question. At, uh, Wolfgang and Charles, uh, uh, recently the Chinese government published a list of unreliable overseas enterprises. Uh, do you think this is a response, a policy response uh, to the uh, list of uh, entity list uh, that the U.S. government uh, uh, delivered? Well, uh, what I, I, think, I, think, I think, I think, I uh, think, for, for China, you basically have to protect yourself mm -hmm. because what we what we're getting from the U.S. For example, the attack on Huawei. Has there been a single instance of identification of a backdoor in the Huawei system? No. If you're guilty, that's it. We say so. So when things get so ridiculous. You have to come up with some means or some format to protect yourself. And this would never have happened if the attacks against China, or Chinese institutions, are now against Chinese foreign students and visa applicants. And Wolfgang, so, do you have this uh, stronger feeling that China is talking tough, and increasingly mm -hmm. so, in response to the unilateral policy moves of the Trump administration? Yeah, I have a feeling that we are talking too much. Of course, there's a strong impact by Trump and all his uh, strange measures. But it's not the case that without Trump, everything would be okay. Observing the last 20 years, we have seen uh, many, many steps of reform in China until 2006, and it was a bit slower. And in 2012, we were hoping there is another wave of uh, reform. And there were a lot of announcements of reform. And what we could not see is that there is a delivery of all these reforms that is a bit slow. So there is disappointment, definitely, on the European side, what has been achieved here in China so far. And we are really desperately waiting for the delivery of all these announcements. And that's yet to come. Uh, and that is completely different story that's not influenced by the American behavior. Well, in the 21st century, the hallmark uh, uh, for facilitating the process of globalization is the increase in service, the service uh, uh, pro provided. Now, I think speed European is complaints are about... a matter because the price, uh, your vice premier just traveled to Germany. He talked to the minister of economy, to the chancellor, etc., about sort of pulling Germany closer to China when it comes to the global trade war. I, I wonder, um, you've been 40 years in business with such a lot of experience. How do you end the kind of trade war between the United States and China? Because it's affecting everybody and it's affecting the whole climate. It seems to be down spiraling all the time. Uh, let me clarify his question a little bit further. Uh, the business community of the United States uh, used to be a stabilizing force in improving the bilateral relationship uh, between Washington and Beijing. It's no longer such a strong factor. Why? Actually, Actually, come back to the U.S. side. U.S. business, because of the tax break, did very well. The CEOs did very well. But what happened to the money that came back from the tax break? A major U.S. economic institute came out with a study. The tax break money all went into stock buybacks because they didn't, they didn't have confidence in making further investments. The stock buyback brought the Dow Jones Industrial and the S&P 500 to record level after record level. If it weren't for the stock buybacks, it would be 19% lower than today. So most of the CEOs, their bonuses are tied to share price. So most of them are not complaining. That to them is more important now than defending China. But, but how would you end this? Because you let I don't, terrorists I don't, on each other you know, billions I, of dollars. Will, will it end? I don't think it will end okay. in the near future. It's not possible because what the Trump administration has embarked on in terms of China bashing now to the point of yellow peril. You know, so should China 
follow a strategy of okay, leave the U.S. where they are because it's difficult to negotiate which, which with them and take care of everyone else of the EU, which for is example, exactly what they're Canada, doing. Canada, Germany. Yeah, not only Canada, or G Germany, Britain, and so on, but look at the improvement of relationship between China and India, mm. the improvement of relationship between China and Japan. Russia as well. And Russia as well. <coughs> and the ASEAN countries. This is the first time in Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore. I was ASEAN there. I covered whole process. I witnessed the, yeah. uh, the, the, the rivalry. Mm. And of the course, German companies want, don't want to be pushed into a situation where they have to choose That's with right. whom they want to partner. Mm. Mm. We yeah, have an excellent partnership with, uh, with China. And of course, we want to expand it. We have more than 5,000 German companies here doing business. And most of them are... Uh, still very optimistic on their future. Let me ask you this question. Do you think Europeans will have to take side if the world were to deliver a dual track, a high tag yeah, market? That's, that's, I mean, that's similar, that's similar to, the, to Andrea's uh, question. The Chinese and the rest of France mm -hmm. and the America, yeah. North America, the other side. Do you think you have to take side? It's, I think similar to Andrea's question, where his yeah, question is. Yeah, right he frames it differently. You framed it like, in a way, can we carve out? that dispute, you know, <laughs> can, we, can we leave this yeah. to the Americans and the Chinese and we make good business uh, in the middle, uh, which sounds much, much nicer than uh, having to choose sides. I think we will definitely not be able to choose sides. I mean, it all doesn't really take enough consideration uh, of the complexity of the globalization we are in already. That's the point. We just don't have German companies investing in China and their subsidiaries investing in the United States. We are so intertwined that I even worry that if China has an unreliable entity list, which is meant to be against the Americans, that we are not caught in there as well because every German company has American suppliers, has American customers, has American subsidiaries, and it's all intertwined. So this is my worry. I would love the carve out, you know. Uh, the second best solution would be that at least China tries to limit or, or narrow down any usage of national security, retaliatory, uh, narrow it down as much as ever possible to, to reach that little bit of carve out that might be possible so that the other business with Europe and the rest of the world can really go into the direction it, you know, it was left at the end of last year, where we said it was pretty reliable, we, there's room to improve, but, uh, you know, we could move on that path. So we, we don't want to de get derailed from that path, neither China nor us. But I don't think we'll ever be able to choose between one or the other. That's going to be a Allegedly, class. whether China would minimize the use of national security to protect our own high technology largely depends on whether you take side with the Americans. Um, for example, um, if you exclude Huawei from your talent infrastructure from Europe, then China would seriously give a second thought about whether national security would be applied equally mm. uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, there are two sides to this. One is what the government's politicians say. Second is what the businesses say. Okay. For example, why is it that they put in a 90-day delay in implementation of blacklisting Huawei? It's because 25% of rural America runs on Huawei equipment. What about after-sales service? What about components? What about the European companies? Are you going to take everything down and put in Ericsson and new Nokia? And it's and just in impossible. In Europe, everybody knows that establishing a 5G network without Huawei will be very difficult because we haven't got the technology 60, the players. 60 billion euros more yeah. and 18 months longer. So I think a lot of this, what we will see is U.S. administration come bashing first and then think about the consequences. The 90 days today is because of 25% of rural America using Huawei equipment. How, how can you have this system go down because you can no longer work with Huawei. Look, Amazing. gentlemen, the wolf is already on the doorsteps. Uh, uh, recently, the Ministry of uh, Industry and Information announced uh, that they're going to issue a uh, license uh, for 5G, and Huawei will, of course, uh, play the leading role, mm -hmm. and all of the other telecommunication giants in China will follow up very quickly, hence the start of the 5G era, first in China. What does that impact actually mean for Europeans? Mm -hmm. Wolfgang? Charles and I, we were agreeing before the actual uh, program. program started here that business goes on. We have to find pragmatic solutions here. 
um, no matter what the disruptive decisions at a certain stage might be. And I want to make a very clear point here that uh, the majority of uh, German and uh, European companies are, of course, willing to expand business uh, with our most important trading partner, China. Mm -hmm. yeah. Germany, not everything, not everything is affected Germany by the is too far away from the guard, but very close to Nokia and uh, well, other telecommunications. Nokia yeah. is I mean, dwarf now. You know, it used to be a giant, but it's a dwarf now. So, I mean, we're lacking these uh, giants, and that is actually something that the Minister of Economy was try of Germany was trying to, well, uh, establish with his uh, strategy policy paper. Um, come back to these giants, create European giant, giants, etc. If you're an advisor to the Minister of the Economy, what would you suggest to him how to handle this question? Okay, I'm, uh, disclaimer, <laughs> I'm not an advisor on this topic and he didn't ask me on this topic anyway, before he put out you the paper. Him so, on the plane, uh, I mean, China, <laughs> yes, uh, that's true. I will. Well, um, I mean, the, 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 the first rebound, thing, the DNA, you know, the first thing is your reaction coming from the, from the German DNA. And the German DNA is we love our hidden champions, and we are not really in favor of okay. uh, you know huge champions. But okay. of course we have enough huge champions, and um, and we shouldn't neglect them. But sort of from the heart, it's like you know what can you do to help the hidden champions? And um, the question is whether this is really up to the government to decide on how to create uh, champions or rather set the regulatory environment to get more innovation and get more modern well, industries so going. No one wants to different. return to the Cold War. It's, it's basically the question. And ladies and gentlemen, no one wants to return to the Cold War. Uh, uh, some of the strong Chinese voices here say, unless the European Union agrees to take sides with the United States to form a coalition the willing to contend or restrict the growth of China in the 5G area, there won't be uh, a serious idea of a Cold War coming back. Ray, Charles, that won't happen. It won't happen, right. Won't because happen. of what, the what issue. Mr. Trump will do with the EU. Okay, the delay on the tariffs on cars, for example. Now, my friends from Washington tell me, just wait, that's the <coughs> next target. Or even the Swiss, the demand they made on the Chinese government in terms of having inspectors in Chinese SOEs, major SOEs. The Swiss is planning the possibility of US government demanding placement of inspectors in Swiss banks. So what potentially can happen in terms of auto tariffs, for example, or for the Swiss inspectors in Swiss banks from the US Treasury, these are not out of the picture compared to what he's doing now. You know, what he's doing in terms of demanding to, to answer your question, I think we're looking for unanimous European answer to that, not country by country, which is the same point that Are we you have talking with the about belt. BRI, Italy. I, I'm just Italy. coming to it. I'm just coming to it. I'm trying to frame the new <laughs> <laughs> our last chapter here. Um, the same question with the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, of course. Germany and France haven't taken part yet, uh, but they're trying to form or they're setting up talks to have a unanimous decision by Europe on that. But then we have Italy and others. Uh, who are joining it. So how would you rate the success of getting a EU unanimous vote on Belt and Road Initiative? Of course, uh, one can be skeptic if you see developments like in Italy, but is the Italian decision a unanimous one? We have a very strange government in Italy, <laughs> in Italy from far left to far right wing politicians. And one individual China expert took the decision to step into the MOU. Uh, I don't know whether this is really Italy uh, stepping in. So already on this level uh, it's getting difficult and of course also on European level. And what China is doing is uh, to try to have a divide and rule policy and that's what we really uh, criticize so we are uh, actually well, if accepting the why do the same thing but yeah, why is europe so hesitant what what is the core of the issue yeah but can i just uh, my my thought is 
we are accepting the one China policy, for example, we really respect it. And China should respect the one Europe policy. So it's uh, really okay, not a good idea. Can we agree on that? That would be a success. The rise of populism yeah, in Italy. This will, this will Isn't that a European idea way. to have a single voice, to have a consensus? Let me go back to the BRI. In let Europe. Let 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 have a look me in the eye and say, honestly, are you going to have a consensus? I know. We have our yes. issues. One we have to do our homework. But it is really helpful if China is not interfering with one plus, uh, plus 16 or 70 formats, that's simply not helpful. Uh, that is uh, interfering in this process. It's difficult enough, uh, I would agree, what you are saying. So uh, if China is interested in having a partnership with Europe at this stage, Please stop so this then 16 plus 1. Let me, let me, let me get back to the BRI. Uh, so many European countries, mm. he's going to have more uh, such bilateral or multilateral uh, political meetings with the European politicians. Uh, does that mean more consultation will be conducted between the two sides, European Union and China, about what you are concerned with the divide and rule, uh, which China will, of course, deny vehemently? Mm. Let, let me come back to the BRI question. I mean, apart from the fact that there is one Europe, um, we, of course, shouldn't object to regional discussions, if you want to put it that way. From a business perspective and from a commercial perspective, what happened at BRI, whether Italy signs a, a policy paper or not, for me personally, that's not really the very big deal. That's a political deal more. But the question for the BRI is, what are we doing at BRI, and what is the success, and how do we measure the success? And then your question, why is Germany hesitant? It's not hesitant in the terms of connectivity. We have enough European programs for the Eastern countries that in some, if you sum up the amounts, it's not really modest. It really comes pretty close to, but to a huge investment. But strong narrative, obviously. It is the, the narrative, that, the is narrative that's better, over yeah. at the Chinese yeah. side. So we have, at the end, the same goal. We want to develop the same area of connectivity. You got the better narrative. So now what's better on our side, we have to figure out. But how do you measure success? When will BRI be a success? And that's not a question of size and concrete and bridges. That's the success is there if the local countries and their people along the road, they consider it's been successful for them that their development has increased. And that's sort of where our idea comes in, that it all depends on standards. It also depends on standards and transparency. And then Xi Jinping himself said it has to be open, green, and clean. So we, we agree to all that, open, green, and clean. But it's more the standards and the deliverables for the countries themselves where we have to find out more opportunities. And I think one proposal has been coming to to Laura, one proposal has been that before any financing is done or before any insurance pro is done, that there is an environmental Laura, assessment. Laura, do you have any statistics to support <laughs> the idea of <laughs> BRI? <laughs> you delivered so she, many she figures. The, the <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I don't have statistics, but I have oh. examples. I have <laughs> examples. <laughs> you need that. Yeah. Yeah. Wolfgang asked about uh, not just saying we need to do in terms of opening up. I want to give examples from the finance. China recently have a rule about lifting the upper shareholding uh, limits of a foreign finance company to a local commercial bank. In fact, uh, there's an example, a Germany uh, in insurance company, Alliance. Alliance. I, I know that because I buy that insurance from that company for my daughter. Congress. And actually got approved Congress. for open 100% holding share in China. And also auto industry, we leave the, the upper holding limit. And it is that yeah. BMW has raised and the state holding. This is really appreciated. And the yeah. cases you are mentioning, we of course well observe that BSF and BMW Allianz case, exactly. beautiful. But this sh should not be only lighthouse projects, it should be normal uh, as well for the hidden champions. It's not enough that you just create uh, some uh, very individual success stories, that's good, but not good enough. We, g we have to reach a certain situation that this is normality, even for the supplier, even for the SME company, that they can have their own 100% uh, wholly foreign owned in the automotive sector. And um, that's, that's what we are challenging. Perhaps this is a cultural shock. Uh, Europeans expect China to, have a, to adopt a shock therapy, but China prefers to do things step by step. Uh, we undertake a pilot program in the first place to figure out if this works. And for example, mm -hmm. taking Guangzhou, Shenzhen as an example 40 years ago, they were the pilot programs. And now if this were to succeed, the rest of the country would soon follow as follows you very quickly. Mm -hmm. Sabine was uh, def defining success 
Right. In BRI, yes, I would totally agree. Your definition is true, but there is another element of success. Of course, a German company would define success that they have a share in these projects, and that's what we are still not observing. Of course, many, many German companies have the right technology, they have the right products to be part of Berlin Road. But today, up to date, the statistics show that up to 90, even more than 90 percent of the project is simply Chinese. They bring their own really materials. Really, ask you, let me ask you a short personal question. You're living in a very nice house. Some neighbors away are not so nicely uh, situated. You offer them to renovate their house and you sign a contract. Would you do this in China? What makes you so sure to get your money back? I hear that there's now concern in China, within China, that with the BRI, a lot of debt is created in China. It's not sure if the, the capital is given to foreign countries for the BRI will ever return. You are talking about the alleged debt trap. Now, we not only have a barter trade if there are uh, cash uh, shortage, we could probably for example, in, in the case of a neighboring uh, house uh, uh, that needs my money, investment for the refurbishing, I would uh, ask for cheap house cleaning, the labor import, and say, come over and do a couple of hours of house cleaning every day instead of providing, with me, uh, providing me with the cash. So we have various ways to be flexible, uh, okay. and therefore uh, it's not just about uh, building up the debt trap. It's uh, how you look at things in a more flexible manner. This is the Chinese uh, way of uh, looking at things in a holistic picture. Uh, you don't have to have all details in a contract. Uh, speaking to a Southeast Asian... So you're not Asian, concerned about that? No, speaking to a Southeast Asian Minister of Finance, I won't name the country, but uh, this is just a few months ago, talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. And he said, we need to build infrastructure for our social development, our economic development, and we're not getting financing from Wall Street. So we have to get it. So ultimately, by the end of this very wonderful, impressive uh, uh, brainstorming on uh, the future of the EU-China relationship about the free trade or globalization, let me ask you, are we going to go back to the Cold War? At least the tech Cold War, financial Cold War, what about the uh, Washington the Federal Reserve switching off the SWIFT? Uh, because we have been so excessively reliant on US dollar in our settlement of global transactions is an important part of global payment. Do you think Europeans are clearly aware of the dangers since the cancellation of the Iran nuclear deal? Overseas multinationals in the European Union don't want to be punished by American domestic law. They dislike the idea of a long arm jurisdiction. So are we going to go back to the Cold War um, in terms of a financial Yes, process? of course, you are right with your question. Everybody is concerned uh, regarding the current situation, but we as Europeans will always fight for cooperation and multilateral solutions. So we will never stop, we will not give in. And uh, as long as we hold up our principles of collaboration and multilateralism, um, that's fine. And uh, let's see what our partners are doing. And we hope that they are also on the path Shall of cooperation. Uh, what's your sense about going back to Cold War, okay. financially and technologically? Okay. In all research, there are lots of study has been found in the past four decades, China's economic growth has benefited a lot from opening up. So we benefit from opening up for sure, I would accept that. Certainly we'll keep opening up. So we don't like the Cold War, and I don't think that's our choice. Okay. And uh, I hope we're not um, too long in a Cold War phase. What I think we have to learn, nevertheless, is to survive in a low trust world. I, I, I think, I think uh, sooner or later, there will be people in the United States who will stand up to what the Trump administration is doing and go back to globalization because the world cannot afford it. We cannot have a hot Cold War or a cold hot war because that's beyond description, potentially what could happen. But there are so many interlinks. As Wolfgang said, the global economy is so tightly meshed together that it's not possible to have two of everything. And, and what do you want to say to conclude our discussion We Germans here, and Europeans, we always look at sustainability, so we are in, in here for the long run. Thank you very much, Ray, for this wonderful program. It's good to exchange views. Thank you to ZTTN and uh, NDR for doing this dialogue uh, here in Guangzhou. My warm thanks go to all of the participants here, including Andrews, of course, from NDR. Um, my closing remarks are simple. Put on a smile, 
despite the humidity and bad weather of Guangzhou. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Stay in Germany. Thank you so much. Well,